Good morning, Mr. Clerk. Please call. Over to Here. Alderman Moore. Alderman Moore. Here. Alderman French. Present. Alderman Vaccaro. Present. Alderman Carter. Present. Alderwoman Murphy. Here. Alderman Ogilvie. Here. Mr. President. Here. Chairman Conway. Present. Nine present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, good morning, everybody, for coming out. Um, this is the, a, a public meeting of the Ways and Means Committee, and we would expect everyone to act accordingly um, here. No cheering. Uh, it's not a pep rally. If you have something that you want to say, um, or cheer, or wave signs, or whatever, um, we do have the rotunda right outside the door. Um, Alderwoman Tamika Hubbard on board bill number 219. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, committee. I'm here on behalf of Board Bill 219. Um, hopefully this is um, one of the few meetings that we have left. I think we've done an excellent job in properly educating the public on what we have here before us. Um, basically what this bill does is it authorizes the financing agreement for a new stadium. I think it's important for us to mention that um, we will have approximately $2 billion in investment if we get this deal and um, NGA. We're talking about the upwards of three to 4,000 construction careers, uh, 2,600 seasonal jobs. Um, 60 to 70 percent of those seasonal jobs are currently held by minorities and I think it's important for us to mention the countless number of hours that have gone into the Minority Inclusion Plan. I uh, would like to commend some of my colleagues who actually sit on the community who came uh, on board and tried to help us get this thing done because that, that's what it's about. Um, it's bigger than football for me. It's about creating opportunities. It's about creating development in an area that has seen 60 years of disinvestment. And with that being said, I would just like for us to um, all try to come together and do what's in the best interest of the city and its residents. And at this time, I'll bring for my colleague Jack Coder, who will speak to some of the changes that have came about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, let me start by saying thank you for all the work uh, many of you have done uh, and for all the hearings you've held. I know a lot of people have been working some long hours on this project. Um, there is a committee substitute in front of you, and uh, before I begin, I was hoping we could take up that committee sub if someone would be so inclined to make a motion. I move that we adopt committee substitute for board bill number 219. It's been moved and second that we adopt committee substitute for 219 so that we can have a discussion of the changes. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman French? Aye. Alderman Vaccaro? Aye. Alderman Carter? Aye. Alderman Murphy? Aye. Alderman Ogilvie? No. President? Chairman yeah, Conway? Aye. Seven votes to take it up. It passes. Thank you. Proceed, Alderman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so the committee substitute that's now in front of you, Board Bill 219, committee sub, uh, the, one of the major changes between this and the previous version of the project finance and construction and lease agreement is uh, some, how some of the revenues, where they go. Basically, we've swapped the naming rights uh, for the tax rebates uh, in the previous iteration. Um, the part of the city's contribution was going to come from the naming rights uh, from enterprises that were going to be bonded, and that was 75 million of the city's contribution. Uh, that has changed. The NFL will now keep the naming rights for this project, uh, but the proposed tax rebates, which none of the rebate amounts have changed. We're still looking at, and we can go through that structure. I'll, wait, I'll let Noel and Otis handle that. Uh, but instead of rebating the NFL, the, the, the game day taxes, those tax rebates, which will be part of the city's contribution, will go to the RSA and be bonded by the RSA. So we're keeping the tax rebates within a governmental entity, which I think is a, a, a positive improvement to this plan. Um, the city is not on the hook for any additional costs 
the city's contribution to this project does not change under this agreement. Um, and I want to stress that this whole project does not happen without a commitment of $450 million from the NFL uh, and the team owner, and also $160 million in PSLs and the state's $250 million contribution. <coughs> and of course, the commitment that we actually have in the NFL football team. Um, so in another addition to this uh, agreement is the inclusion of a cooperation agreement that I know uh, a number of the members of the committee worked hard to get included. Uh, the cooperation agreement will make sure that the tax dollars that are being rebated, that are going to the RSA, are being properly accounted for, and I think that's a great development uh, on this bill. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce Otis Williams uh, from the St. Louis Development Corporation uh, to talk a little more in detail about some of the changes. Uh, I'm looking forward to a big discussion of this today, answering questions. I know we have members of the task force here available as well to answer questions. Uh, and I also look forward to uh, discussing the minority inclusion plan that I hope gets introduced via amendment. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn it over to Otis. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, oh, we're here again, and I believe we've had uh, several public meetings where we've gone through in great detail uh, the uh, financing, and so we will hit uh, some of the highlights here today. And, uh, and uh, I'll, I will basically start by reminding everyone that uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that we are doing this is because it will benefit the state and the city. Uh, and that the part of the uh, issues that we have here is that this will increase the uh, sports activity and recreation entertainment and convention and tourism activities in the city. It will increase the state and local tax revenues through the creation of new jobs and the retention of existing jobs. And it increases the state and local revenues uh, through increased sales and increased state and local revenues through increased property revenues, property tax revenues, and increased uh, state and local tax revenues through increased income taxes. And it also it creates an environment to stimulate additional private investment in an area where in which the project will be located. And so one of the things that we, uh, and I, we've, we've said a number of times and uh, reiterated a, a moment ago, is that this will bring over $2 billion of investment uh, to North St. Louis. And, uh, okay, you got it? St. Louis Public Radio. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't hear. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. So uh, this is an opportunity to bring over $2 billion of investment in the near north of uh, the city in North St. Louis. Uh, this is a uh, bang for, big bang for the buck, $150 million city commitment, gener which generates $850 million of other investment. And uh, I guess the point we want to make is that, uh, that $850 uh, million is not available uh, for other uses, uh, except for uh, the uh, support of this uh, particular stadium. And so with, with that, what I want to do at this point is bring up Noel Pfeffer, who is with the, he's an economist with the mayor's office, who will uh, go through some of the uh, changes in the, uh, in, the financial, in the financial analysis. So, Noel. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for your time and consideration of the proposal uh, before you today. Uh, I know you've heard my spiel a couple of times now, so I'll be brief. I won't go into too much detail, but I'm happy to answer any questions and just go over the key takeaways. Um, first things first, we're talking about a $1 billion project here um, in the near north side, $150 million of which comes from the city. The $150 million city contribution is contingent on the following contributions. $200 million from the NFL, $250 million from the NFL team, $160 million in the sale of seat licenses, and $240 million from the state. We don't put in a dime unless they commit those $850 million. So where does our $150 million comes from? 
Now, as you know, uh, one of the changes in today's board bill is that it has grown from 145 million to 150 million. Um, that breakdown is, as before, the city's additional debt obligation is 70 million dollars. The estimated rebate value, however, has grown from 75 million to 80 million. What this means, as before, we are rebating 64 percent of stadium of revenues generated by the new stadium. All that has happened is that the estimated value of that rebate has gone up. As before, we rebate 64 percent of whatever the projections turn out to be. If the projections turn out to be lower, we rebate less money. If they turn out to be higher, we rebate more. From the city's perspective, this hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is the estimate. It's also important to emphasize that another piece that has changed is whereas before this risk was borne by the NFL team, which committed naming rights um, to this bond, that risk is now being borne by the state. Um, so again, um, if revenues come in below the city's projections, we do not bear that risk. We provide less money. Um, so with that uh, clarified, I also want to emphasize that this $150 million contribution by the city is um, historically low for stadium uh, agreements. On average, uh, stadiums are 45% publicly funded, um, and often cities have to do that alone. If the city was putting in $450 million for a $1 billion stadium, this would not make sense. Um, but thankfully, we have a state that understands that the city cannot do it alone um, and is providing us with support. And that leaves us with a deal that makes sense. So for this $150 million investment, we expect to generate $130 million in direct revenues throughout the stadium's construction and operation. Specifically, we get through these through earnings tax paid by the players, construction workers, and operations and maintenance staff. We get this thanks to permit fees from the construction of the stadium, amusement tax, a 5% tax on ticket sales, a 3% sales tax on uh, all sales inside the stadium, a 1.5% food and beverage tax uh, on uh, sales of food and non-alcoholic beverage uh, within the stadium, um, and finally, uh, the 5% parking gross receipts tax. We are not accounting for any sort of indirect impacts here. If property values go up, that would be fantastic. We don't consider that. Similarly, if bars see greater expenditures, uh, thanks to having the NFL in St. Louis, that would be fantastic. The city would certainly see a benefit. We don't consider that. It's also very important to emphasize that this $130 million does not exist if we don't put in this $150 million investment. So the true cost of the city's contribution is in fact $20 million, right? We're putting in $150 million, and if we didn't put that in, we would lose $130 million. Um, it's also very important to, ask, uh, to emphasize that this $130 million uh, estimate of the direct revenues generated at the stadium is conservative. We revised task force estimates downward in four key ways. We assumed fewer people would attend the game, that they would pay less to go, that they would spend less at the stadium, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, even though NFL revenues have grown historically at roughly 4%, we estimate that they will grow into the future at 2%, just indexing it to inflation. So we would not be surprised to see uh, real revenues outpace projections. So let's talk about that $20 million real cost that is uh, before you today, the additional budgetary commitment um, that you're considering. I don't want to talk about indirect benefits, but I do want to consider direct impacts that do not impact the city budget, direct impacts that do impact city citizens, and there are many. First off, as has been mentioned, 3,000 jobs paying $180 million in wages. Of that, I know there's a minority um, plan uh, being considered, uh, and that the minimum rate of city resident participation will be 25%. That means $45 million in uh, wages to city residents. Furthermore, we retain 2,600 jobs associated with the operation of the stadium, 70% of which are by minorities. There's uh, other benefits to city citizens. For example, thanks to the NFL, 600,000 individuals <coughs> come into the city um, for, for games, and they spend here. Uh, if you just consider their expenditures at the stadium, the parks, schools, and metro um, collect sales taxes. Schools collects a two-thirds sales tax, 
Parks collects, uh, Great Rivers Greenway collects a slightly more than a quarter cent sales tax, and Metro collects a half cent sales tax. They would lose those revenues without a new stadium, and that comes out to roughly $25 million in today's dollars over the course of the next 30 years. Another impact, you can't build a stadium without redeveloping the riverfront. There are 53 parcels on the project site. 50 of them are vacant. 30 of them have hazardous materials associated with them. They're also in the stadium, in the $1 billion stadium construct, uh, project costs, 20 million of that, <coughs> roughly, is allocated to parks and trails, a public good. Another direct impact of uh, building the stadium, and this is important, is that it helps keep the city solvent. If we lose the Rams, and every indication is that this is their last season without a new stadium, and I think task force individuals here can speak to that uh, further, if we lose the Rams, we will be left paying $6 million in 2017 with no revenue. And that means we need to find the roughly $4 million that the Rams bring in revenue elsewhere in our budget. We need to reallocate that away from other funding priorities, whether it be social services, police, transportation, what have you, it needs to come from somewhere. And that's why if you extend, if you retain the Rams revenue, we can actually pay for uh, this new stadium without at any point reallocating money away from existing funding priorities and without new taxes. And that was a major goal for us going into this. Um, and finally, another direct impact, though it is intangible, is that the NF St. Louis gets to remain an NFL city. Um, and though it's hard to quantify, I don't think many people would dispute that such an impact um, exists. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and go into more detail as necessary. I want to emphasize that from the city's perspective, the financing has not changed. We are putting, we are um, committing to 70 million in additional debt obligation and a 64% tax rebate. The only thing that has changed is our projections for what that rebate might generate. And if it comes in below our projections, we're not on the hook. Thank you. Um, and then, no, well, don't go anywhere. I'll just come on up to. Um, and so uh, we'll work through all the committee members and we'll do five minutes for questions. Then at the end, we'll do eight minutes for closing for each committee member. Um, we'll swing back if we don't use up all of that time. Um, but uh, just to give you an idea, I don't care if you go a minute or two over or if you've got that many questions, you know, we'll keep coming back. Um, Alderman Kennedy, you're first. You're the most senior alderman here. <laughs> No, it's not the oldest, just the one that's been here the longest. Uh, um, okay, you're saying that the city's contribution is still the same. That's right. But it's, been, it's carved up differently? Um, essentially, the only change is the estimate for what the rebate um, will allow us to bond out. Okay, but, but not the estimate, not, not the percentage amount of that. Just Right, the percentage is identical. Okay, and, and what is the difference? In, the difference is that uh, now with the state <coughs> underwriting um, and creating a debt service reserve fund, uh, we're able to bond uh, slightly more. You're able to bond slightly more, you say? Sir? I didn't hear, you said you're able we're to. We're able to bond five million more. Five million more. Right, so that's, that jumped from, set, the projection jumped from 75 million to 80 million. Okay, all right. And Thank again, if, if our projections are off, we don't bear that risk. But we still, you still pay the same we pay the percentage. 60, we pay 64% of whatever right. the real revenues turn out to be. All right, then. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Alderman Moore. I asked uh, you the numbers, man. And mm -hmm. I asked you last time for, for a spreadsheet on the monies that's already spent on this stadium, where they're coming from, where the money is coming from, and who gets the money. Can you provide me with those, that, with that document? Uh, not with the document, but to answer your question broadly, uh, we spent six million. I don't want an answer broadly. I need something in writing to tell me each person that got money, how much was spent on so far on the stadium, and where it come from. The city pays six million dollars a year, and that is from general revenue, which means it's not tied. No, no, he's speaking of the RSA. Yeah. So uh -huh. I understand your question, Alderman, and so uh, why he don't understand it, Otis? He's there. No, no, he understands. That's his position. He, 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 he the one been giving me all the numbers. He just uh, what he heard you say, and what he's trying to answer is the six million dollars that we spend every year to service the current debt. And so what what we are trying to do now, and what you what you've asked. Uh, many of the expenses really are within the RSA, and we do not have access to that. 
And so uh, we don't have it, but uh, I understand your question. You say you don't have it? I, I do not have it because it's not a, it's not a city. I mean, meeting. I've asked for it prior to this meeting, and I've asked several times for it, so why we don't have it? It's critical for my vote. I understand all of it. I will um, work and see if I can get at least what they can give us. Or that they know and get it to you. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Okay. That's all I have for now. Okay. Alderman French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, to Mr. Moore's point, I, I think uh, he did make that information request at the last meeting. Uh, I think it was promised. So, I think somebody from the RSA or uh, the task force should probably provide that. I don't think that's very difficult to, to uh, get. We're great. I do think that some media outlets had made a sunshine request, so media outlets may have it. I think the committee should also have it. So, if you can make that happen, maybe make that call or shoot that text message out. Whatever we got to do. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. Questions here. Um, so first, uh, actually, Mr. Chairman, I had made a request uh, uh, whether or not we were going to hear from the budget director and or the comptroller's office. Will we hear um, either the budget director's or the comptroller's office analysis of these recent changes to this, the financing component? Um, you sent me that request at 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon while I was at the... Oh, that was uh, at least two days ago. Well, my secretary forwarded me the email while I was at the ear, nose, and throat doctor yesterday. Yeah. So anyway, I, I know that Mr. Paul Payne is in the room. Um, Mr. French has um, the director of the CBC coming today. I mean, not Mr. French, uh, Mr. Ogilvy is having... Um, I hope so. Okay. Here today. And um, he asked, you know, three or four days ago, I told him to go ahead and make those arrangements with that particular person. Um, so can we ask questions of Mr. Payne since he's in the room? Uh, we can get to him, but we're going to go through the questions on the changes here. Okay. As long as we can get to him today, that'd be fine. Um, so, Mr. Noel, how are you? <laughs> okay, so first, uh, you were introduced as an economist. That's not exactly true, right? Are we doing this again? Uh, I'm just, it, it was presented again as an economist. And the question it, it relates, though, to you said that the city's contribution is $150 million. That's not exactly true, though. So uh, that does not take into account, that's the, uh, whatever lump sum would be received uh, by the RSA, uh, but does not account for what the actual payment of the city would be over time. So what would the city taxpayers actually pay over time? So to clarify, the $150 million is the figure in today's dollars. Uh, if I'm, I'm going to answer your question in nominal dollars, but I want to be clear that if that's going to be comparable, then we also need to consider the state's contribution in nominal dollars, which roughly doubles. No, no not, I'm not even talking about net present value. I mean simply the total sum of our payments over a 30-year period. Right. And, and you can net present value that. Oh, then that's the 150 million. But that's not the total sum of our payments. Over it's actually 152.5 million, the net present value of the total sum of our payments. So there's no interest. At 4.7 percent discount rate, the net present value. So, so everyone understands when we say net present value. Uh, no, Sorry, when we say net present value, that means uh, accounting for interest rates, risk, um, and inflation. What does money in 2050? Uh, what is that value today? So, for example, if uh, anyone asks, would you rather have $200 today or $200 in 2050, you say $200 today because you value that more highly than you value it in 2050 because of inflation, risk, uh, and potential interest rates. Okay, so, so for the sake of speed, let's just assume everybody knows what we're talking about. So, what I'm asking you is what is the total sum of the payments that the city will make over the 30-year period? In net present value. Just uh, the total sum, not even net present value. Let's do the first one first. Alright, so when I answer this in total sum, I want that to be comparable then. Just answer the question. It's uh, roughly uh, $220 million, although um, that is $180 million in additional um, money, and that's for the $70 million debt obligation. That's for the $70 million debt obligation? The, the number you're looking for is roughly $300 million. Uh, it's the value of the rebate, plus right. uh, that's nominal. So if you consider the $150 million city contribution, that $300 million, you also have to consider the $240 million state contribution well, just let of us, we'll, we'll, we'll $450 just, we'll, million. We'll decide what we have to contribute. But I'm asking you to provide facts. 
Right, and, so and I'm trying to. This is one notes. of the reasons that um, we asked for the budget director to come, because the budget director typically provides us facts uh, with free of his interpretation. So I'm not asking for your interpretation. So, I'm just asking for the numbers. But that's not an interpretation. What he's trying to tell tell you, though, is if you're going to say the city's uh, you, money but is what he's trying to do is pay is, is tell us no, what he, value to put on the state's contribution the sources uh, include all net present value so when you change the <laughs> city's value to it's very hard to get a straight answer here no, no so it's not backing up I just want to three three hundred and what million dollars is how much we would contribute three hundred and three now look three hundred and what three okay period that's it next right. question no if i may. i only have five minutes <laughs> Right. Thank you. It's if you answer if you need facts, then you need numbers that can be compared to one another. That three hundred and three million dollars cannot be compared to the one billion dollar. I'm just asking value. what comes out of the uh, city's budget. So on the one end, the bond payments, and the other end is the rebates. So for example, the city's budget, if it just grows at one point seven percent, mm -hmm. is going to be about. 80% or 90% bigger by 2050. So that contribution. That makes a lot of assumptions, but yes. Okay. 1.7% is what the comptroller's long range financial plan I got estimates you. for okay. the next Just 10 years. A number. That's all I'm asking for is a number. So about $303 million over 30 years is what we're paying back. Gotcha. And similarly, that $130 gotcha. million dollar benefit <laughs> is more like $250 million. All right. Thank you. Otis. So who is actually uh, the entity that issues the bonds? Is it the city issuing the bonds under this new plan, or is oh we go through the RSA? Who is issuing the bonds? So the, the RSA. 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 Okay. Um, is that the case in the entire funding mechanism, or does the state issue its own bonds, or is uh, RSA also the mechanism for in, for issuing those bonds? Uh, you know, I'll state's portion. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Uh, with regard to the state's contribution, right. is the state can uh, will be issuing bonds, or would the RSA be issuing bonds, and the state would reimburse the RSA, similar to our arrangement? The RSA is uh, issuing all bonds. So all bonds would be issued by the RSA. Okay. Um, do you know? Do they have a much higher credit rating than we do right now? No, but I. I, I they will have the backing of the state, though, and the state has okay. a AAA rating as opposed to our rating. Okay. So even the portion that would be paid by our uh, rebates and our payments would be backed by the state? Uh, you know, that, that's probably more a comptroller uh, question uh, than for me at this point, but uh, I believe that uh, we, that's one of the questions we've been working through with the comptroller. Uh, and, what, what is your perspective on? It's my understanding that the $70 million additional debt obligation will be based primarily on the city's credit rating, whereas the $80 million rebate will be based on the state's credit rating. Okay, so that's two different things. So, are you, so it, there a portion would be based on our credit rating? Correct. That's so right, and that's what our calculations are based so on. So that would be backed by, uh, okay. So that would be at a higher interest rate. Right. Okay. Uh, and so this may lend itself to one of the recommendations that the comptroller at least had said publicly, I haven't, we haven't spoken to her in this committee, but it said publicly about um, it, it might be best to either for the state to create another entity or somehow they back the, um, they back the bonds because city taxpayers are going to be paying more uh, on any bonds that are backed by our credit rating versus somebody else's credit rating. Anyway, that's probably a question for the comptroller if we can get somebody from her office to come down. Um, all right, that was really my, and the, the final little statement I'll make too is that um, you guys keep uh, uh, making statements to say that this is being built in, in North St. Louis. Under almost nobody's definition is this stadium being built in North St. Louis. This is being built next to the Four Seasons, okay? <laughs> Unless we have a Four Seasons in North St. Louis I don't know about. Uh, this is ain't North St. Louis. Uh, everybody knows that area is a riverfront. Uh, it's the downtown riverfront. So let's just be straight up about what we're doing, all right? That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Alderman Carter. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, well, well, I heard some of his questions, and not all. So if I ask something similar, just. Just go with me. Um, so, what is the, the sp uh, what is the specific mechanism for paying the remaining dome debt? 
the dome debt is defeased. So we are taking out uh, a $100 million loan, essentially, and spending $29 million of that, uh, actually a bit less now, um, on paying off the dome debt entirely. Uh, and then we're spending the remaining $70 million on, uh, uh, on the project. Okay, so, uh, so basically the dome debt is going to be uh, folded into the new bond, right? Right. So, for example, we're, you're obviously considering payments of $4.5 million growing at 2% through 2050. If we weren't defeasing the dome debt, um, if we were just paying for the new stadium, that would look more like $3.5 million. Okay. So what are the effects uh, on the other parties uh, that are still paying the dome debt? And uh, does it release them from, uh, from their obligation? We, we are the party that, that is paying, except for the operational piece, which you, if you're talking about the uh, preservation fees. Right. So, 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 so the obligations change, right? The preservation payments will remain. Okay. Through 2024. All right. Um, and um, I tried to find it, but where is the language that protects uh, the city from maintenance and overrun um, in here, I didn't see it because uh, the, the bill that I read is currently says that the RSA is responsible, but the city and state could be asked uh, to contribute through um, special tax district. Uh, so a couple. So first of all, um, in order, if there were cost overruns, in order to pay for them, this uh, the city would need to. Uh, allocate money which would require approval by the Board of Aldermen, right? Uh, same with the state. So any cost overruns uh, being paid for by us is contingent on your vote. Um, and somehow I find it unlikely that the Board of Aldermen would approve those. Um, so that's first. Furthermore, uh, there are provisions, I'm forgetting exactly which section though I can get you that, um, which uh, basically ensure that we take out insurance. Um, which shifts the risk of cost overruns um, from the RSA and the city and the state uh, to the project managers. And so we still are on the hook for overruns and, and maintenance? I mean, I know that the RSA is, but the RSA doesn't generate uh, funds. Give us a moment here, just so, so we can confer. But one, one of the other things uh, that we uh, we know that this contract will be a guaranteed maximum price contract that also comes with uh, uh, some some uh, safety, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what, whatever contractor bids on this will bid and and basically go with a guaranteed maximum price uh, for, for, for this. 5.1C also. Uh, reads, the city and state shall have no obligation to provide any funding for the operations or maintenance of the project, um, and then continues that, if requested, you guys would have the option, of course, of raising more money, but again, you would have to approve that. And, okay. and if, if, if I may, I may invite uh, Dave uh, Peacock to, uh, to address some of the issues that you're... All right. That's the way. Who's, who's oh, no, so the question uh, was, uh, the bill currently says that the RSA is responsible uh, for, for maintenance and overruns, but the city and state could uh, be asked to contribute through special tax districts. And um, that would require us to come back to the Board of Aldermen at this point. So we could still be on the hook for it. Um, if we came back and you approved it. And we, so we don't sign a deal that requires that. We sign a deal that the team has to, take to cover those things. Okay. Um, and my last question for you all, I have uh, more questions for Paul Payne if we're going to. If we're going to. Okay. Um, is, uh, was there anything uh, set aside for uh, environmental review and remediation? Um, I think uh, the, our, our, our former, our former comp, uh, comptroller Vervis Jones uh, spoke about when uh, a few times when he was building uh, specific things close to the riverfront, they ran into a long list of uh, problems. Um, and I just want to know, do we have anything set aside specifically for remediation or if we run into different phases and we have to move dirt and do things? Yes, there is. A, they've done a phase one review on the environmental side. They understand, and that was what they submitted for the brownfield tax credits from the state, $43 million. So there's money set aside. Okay. Yeah, and the brownfields, obviously, if there's more 
and, and are qualified expenses for remediation down to the program that allows for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Alderwoman Murphy. Uh, so, uh, most of my questions were answered previously. Just to clarify a few things. Um, with the, the billion plus stadium, St. Louis is, uh, the city is responsible for roughly 15% of the cost, is my understanding. Um, there will be no tax increase as such. And uh, there will be no cuts in service. I know the constituents are worried about cuts, you know, in other services. And uh, so basically, n n nothing like that would happen, would occur. Okay. Right, we have no tax increases right. as part of this. They'd have to be in the finance agreement and in the ordinance if we contemplated them. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Alderman Oak. Um, thank you. So I want to challenge some of the statements that have been made. Um, well, we're doing questions now, but at the end. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll ask some questions. So the, the state, this is a quote, the state understands we can't do this alone. So the question is, is that the same state uh, where 100 and uh, what is it, 141 legislature, legislators signed a letter recently saying they weren't going to pay for the state's component of this? It is the same state, okay. yes. Um, the well-characterized, um, I, I want to I go back to Alderman French's um, point about what, what the total payments are, and we've gone back and forth on this to some extent already. but the. According to your projections, the actual total payments are $414 million over 35 years. That's it's $225 million um, on the bond, and it's $190 million on the 64% tax rebate. Put those two together, it's 220, or excuse me, $414, $415 million, roughly. And that assumes what, what interest rate on the bond are we assuming? I don't remember. Roughly, roughly 4.7%. 4. 4. 4. Okay. And how, how firm are we on that? Because if the interest rate is higher, we're going to have potentially dramatically higher interest payments over the course of 35 years. Well, I would say on, on, on just my answer, you've got the, uh, the, the economist, I'll say, or, or whatever <laughs> here. But, um, the first half, correct. The second half, the rebates are what they are. So they won't, they, they will be somewhat for the city immune to what the interest rate changes would be. Okay. Um, so uh, on an annual basis, though, excluding the first two or three years, on an annual basis, the stadium costs the city $3 million more than it generates in revenue. On average, um, no. Um, so essentially, the way it works is that we generate a surplus um, through 2021, roughly throughout the stadium construction and uh, reducing the debt service. Mm -hmm. um, and then, by extending the two million dollar existing budget allocation through 2050, uh, we can do this uh, without reallocating any money. The average um, is slightly more than two million. And the I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the spreadsheet right now, and it's three million. So it's three million in the beginning, and it falls to 1.5 million by the end, or a little less even. Um, okay. So the but the the point is, we are pulling money from somewhere else that the stadium itself does not generate. That's just a fact. We can't deny that that's a fact, right? I think what. Noel testified is if it's twenty million dollar cost to the city. That's Noel's that's Noel's optimistic net present value cost. I, I would argue that there's ninety nine or a hundred million dollars of, of unfunded liability over the course of thirty five years. So let's agree to dis disagree there. But the the to Noel's point, um, forty five million dollars in wages to city residents uh, was one selling point. Um, the vast majority of the city's budget is wages to city residents. And if we're pulling $100 million over 35 years out of general revenue, over the long haul, we may actually be paying less to city residents um, than we would uh, if we do a stadium project. Because any, any any reduction in the amount we're spending, <coughs> excuse me, 
in general revenue that goes to, to interest payments on this is likely wages we're not paying to a city employee that provides some other service. I mean, that's, the, that's just a fact. The huge, you know, it could be a police well, officer, the question could be a tree trimmer. Well, I, I'm just, I'm challenging the idea that this somehow results we'll in have 10 minutes to challenge higher you. payments to city residents. Is, um, is, excuse me, is Brian McMurtry from the RSA in the school? In the room? <coughs> Anywhere? Like do, do you know? I'll talk, I, I don't know, I don't didn't see him, but Okay. And to everybody. He, he, I'll just speak to your last point because I, I look. I don't know the breakdown of the city budget. How much is wages and how much is not? Um, and I agree with you. Interest expenses, interest expense, um, and that any you know, interest expense is money that doesn't go into people's pocket. I'd also say that right now interest rates are lower over the last 20 years than they've been. Like they've only been lower 8 percent of the time. So from a financing timing. It's as good a time as ever to enter into in financing this type of project, whether it's a football stadium or NGA or anything else. So, but I, but I, I would have to understand the breakdown of the city budget relative to the wages, and if there is a takeaway, it, it, the math could be what you said. That, that's fair. Um, I'm gonna. I, I have some another just brief pushback. Say we have six million dollars a year in unfunded payments if there's no football team in the dome until 2021. We could also refinance that debt and extend it. It's not like there's a requirement that we right. complete this. And we, we could, if the if we're doing this because oh my God, we're going to have a six million dollar hole in the budget. Right. We can get around that. I agree with you. And I think there's also the argument of replacement. That, you know, how much right. is totally gone? How much is so replaced? So that's not an argument. So I don't know why it's being used as a selling point for the stadium. There are other financial options. It's a debt obligation that's out there, but yes. there's you got to pay it. Ways to deal. But we don't have to pay it by 2021. Um, but more to the question component, I, you know, it's my it's my belief that we're not really doing a fair accounting of what the costs are because I think we have to take into consideration the costs of the existing dome, uh, the ongoing maintenance obligation there, and I'm I'm very frustrated that we don't have anyone from the RSA here. I've invited them multiple times. I called every day this week. Um, and I actually had a commitment that they would come. I think come. they're supposed to be here, and I don't know if they're just not here yet. No. Yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, the RSA would own the stadium. We're entering into an agreement with the RSA to own and operate a stadium. I, I, it, it seems to me just irresponsible that we haven't had a representative from the RSA in the room a single time for any of the hearings. Not a single question has been asked of or answered by the RSA. Um, and the, so the, the question I would ask them is, a, what are the ongoing maintenance and debt obligations for the dome? Because we still have to own and maintain the dome when this is done, and we don't. The cost does not end in 2025 when the preservation payments end. There's still costs, and CVC estimates that the the low cost at 2.8 million dollars a year to maintain the dome. So 2.8 on the low end, and that's not for upgrades. That's just to keep it in its current state. So I say we have a three million dollar unfunded liability on the new the new stadium each year and all says it's two million. Um, we gotta add that other two point eight million in at a minimum. So that gets us to I would say five to six million really in unfunded liability every year. And that's before we consider maintenance for a new stadium, which is not accounted for in this funding agreement. There's not a single dollar for maintenance in this funding agreement. Right, so look, on the dome, the, the region faces that issue no matter what. Regardless of this project, the financing agreement was 30 years and there's an end on 2025. So this was <laughs> something that was gonna be before the board. So I, my, my opinion, different than yours, is I wouldn't encumber one project because of a necessary issue to be dealt with no matter what happens. It, it exists either way, that's just my opinion. On, um, the maintenance and operations, as we've structured this, at this point, it would be on the team. So if you can think of Scott Trade Center, for instance, which is publicly owned but maintained and operated by the Blues, that's the kind of agreement we'd be entering into. Yeah, and I, I, I hope that would be the outcome. I just, you know, the fact is, as I've said before, we don't get a bite of that apple. So whatever lease the RSA ends up signing with a the team, they could, 
they could not account for all of that very, well, very easily. I, I guess you say that, but right now I believe in the, the agreement, the financing agreement, it says the city and state will have no further obligation as it relates to operation and maintenance. And yeah, but that's not, those are just, that's word, just words on paper. Well, I think <laughs> words on paper matter because they, what you guys approve and don't approve and they represent the law. So, yeah. you know, it, but it does is it constrains any negotiation to say, look, this is going to have to be the agreement, period. That's going to have to be how it works because there's no, unless people want to come back for another ask, which I think someone said likely wouldn't happen. Yeah, I mean, my, my guess is if things proceed favorably on this, what we're actually going to do is have to then negotiate with the team owner who's going to continue making, uh, continue to extract further concessions, is what I would say. And those concessions very, may, very well may be preservation payments on a new stadium over the course of 30 or 35 years. Well, say, so, so if he asks for that, what do we do? We can't commit by law because it's in the finance agreement attached to an ordinance. So we either have to come back or tell him no. Right. And I think he'll come back. You or the RSA will come back, and we'll end up, you know, oh God, we just got to do it because we almost, we almost landed this team. Just go a little further, and then what is optimistically portrayed as a two million dollar unfunded liability every year. I think if we do the accurate accounting, I think it's more like it could very well be more like ten million a year. And we have there's 320,000 of us. There are a lot of unfunded liabilities in the city. You know, we can't open that balcony up because it's not structurally stable. In this room, we have unfunded liabilities. And okay, that, Alderman, we, no, I'm just, the, the let's, point let's is. Get, let's make it a question. Sure. Who, what, where, when, right, and why? To the question point. Uh, and maybe I need somebody from Hush Blackwell for this one. I'm on page 24 of the committee <laughs> substitute. Second paragraph. Um, what this, what the second paragraph here says is, if our, I think what's called a supplemental rent payment or something in the in in the agreement, if that's not enough, it this instructs the state to go make an additional payment to cover the shortfall. Is that? I'm nodding your head. So, okay. Where, where do we think we get the authority to instruct the state to make appropriations on anything? Well, first, and I, this is actually a question for Hush. Sorry, sorry, oh. David. Hi, Ernesto Segura with Hush Blackwell. To your point, the agreement which the state is agreeing to um, specifically obligates the state. They've taken on the obligation to make a suppl supplemental rent payment in the event that the event day tax revenues do not meet the supplemental rent payment that the city's making. Okay, and and who is agreeing to that at the state level? The commissioner of the Office of Administration will be signing the agreement. And who makes appropriations? Ultimate, at the ultimately level. at the state level, it's the General Assembly after the governor and the Office of Administration put the budget forth and put the line item in. But this will be an agreement that the General Assembly has not approved, correct? They will not vote on this agreement, no. Right. So I think, I think the idea that we are instructing the General Assembly to make appropriations of an unknown amount in the future for an agreement that they have not agreed to is pure fantasy. And we should recognize that this is nothing more than fantasy. And that they're not going to do it. This isn't, we're not looking at reality. I can't, you know, where, where is another, where is a similar agreement where the, the city has instructed the state in the future to make appropriations for something? Is there, any, is there anything else out there like this? I, I mean, I don't know if Ernesto knows. I don't know. Look, Scott, you, you, you've got a certain opinion, and I respect that. I have a different opinion, and I understand where you're coming from. I think at the end of the day, the state, the dome was built under a similar pretense and a similar structure in that the RSA issued the debt. The state General Assembly and Senate approved the RSA statutes. The, the RSA issued the debt. 
and every year the risk of appropriation existed, just like it does today. And that was 50% funded by the state. These bonds rec represent about 15% of funding under the exact same <laughs> time structure with the same exact same risks. I, I think it's a, I mean, it's a different risk because the state approved, the General Assembly approved the prior financing agreement. They approved that debt and they approved a fixed amount of debt. Here we have an unapproved agreement hey, Alderman, that does I not have a, a fixed question. amount. You, you, um, can, you can tell us all of your ideas and, right. and thoughts um, in your closing. Okay, so I'll, I'll just ask one more question. What, what do we think, what's your best estimate on what a necessary preservation payment is from a team signing a lease and, and roughly what an annual lease rate should be? I don't know because it, if you have a situation where the team likes, I'm going to use Scott Trade as an example, um, has responsibility for all operating costs and capital maintenance, they bear the bit risk, they bear those costs. Now they obviously they can book other events, generate revenues to help offset those and basically it puts that risk on the team but it also has probably the party that's best positioned to manage those things doing it. So I think there needs to be a rent payment but under a structure which is different where that we would say you team have the responsibility for operating maintenance like Scott Trade like, like a similar example in our city, they have to bear that risk. And they have the opportunity to generate revenues to help offset those costs. Okay, thanks. All right, um, President Reed, do you have any questions? Alderman French, are uh, you recognized? Oh, can we speak to Mr. Uh, Payne now? Can he bring, we bring him up? Um, if you'd like to ask Mr. Payne a question, Mr. Payne is in the room. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good morning, Mr. Payne. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, so you're the budget director for the city. You maintain the budget and try to keep us from uh, going broke every year. I try. We appreciate your efforts. Um, so, <coughs> currently, uh, the current dome cost us uh, six million dollars a year. Is that right? In, yes. In payments for the current dome, the revenue generated um, based on last year's estimates uh, was about three point eight six million uh, in direct revenue. That's not indirect revenue. Uh, and that includes about 1.8 million in uh, amusement tax. That was from actually NFL games. Mm -hmm. at the dome. Yes. Okay. And so uh, that's just from NFL activity. And so the number for uh, all the activities in that building is a little higher. I would I would suspect it is. Uh, you'd have whatever events that occur not that aren't NFL related uh, expanded convention center, convention center, convention related activities as well. Um, but we still lose money on the dome. Is that right? I, it wouldn't. If someone said, "Is the six million dollar covered today?" Given that you're getting close to maybe four on the NFL games, I wouldn't say that would be too much of a stretch to say that it would be covering the six million. Okay, so we might barely make the sure. uh, cover. Um, so this new stadium, though, would take the NFL activity out of that building Correct. and move it to another building. Right. Um, and from my understanding, uh, well, I'm actually I'm not really clear on in the in the committee sub how amusement tax uh, is handled. But what I do understand from an interview uh, yesterday with NFL official on a local sports radio here is that uh, they feel that under current law, um, if they make a 200 million dollar investment in a stadium, that they would be exempt from the uh, amusement tax. Do you understand that? I understand the question uh, only because it's in context of the other development deals associated with the, both the Blues and the Cardinals. My, my, my understanding is those were different, there were different connotations related to each one of those. And so I don't, from a legal standpoint, I'd have to defer to the city councilor on that. But each, 
appeal is different. Okay, so I only say that because if, um, if they do become a, a exempt from the amusement tax, then the 1.8 million approximately we get right now, we would no longer get. If that were the case. If that was the case. Um, have you had a chance to look over this, this bill? I've, I've actually not seen the bill. I've seen a, uh, the, the finance agreement. Okay. And uh, as the budget director, what's your take on the situation? How does it affect our budget? Do we lose more money? Do we make more money? Um, does it create a budget gap? <laughs> As, been, as it's been presented, I mean, this is an additional obligation that we're going to be incurring. I mean, it's more than uh, the status quo. Um, uh, from the debt side, obviously, when you, there will be an initial obligation, and I understand uh, this would be around $70 million on debt, and now, obviously, when you issue more debt, that goes on your books, and uh, as any, any that would be a credit <coughs> negative, and that's, that's an impact from that standpoint, uh, as any issuance of debt would be. Um, I think from uh, an operational standpoint and, and going forward, I, I, I sort of share the issue on the maintenance side. Uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, in an earlier meeting, uh, when we did the dome financing, there was an asset preservation account and those were sort of all decided in advance what those amounts would be. I, I, I think the question of an ongoing uh, preservation account, and it, both day to day as well as when you're talking 35 year term debt, you're talking about what happens in year 10 when you need to make a, re a renovation to the facility, that type of thing. Both day-to-day both -day as well as uh, sort of renovation type uh, maintenance <coughs> obligations. I, I think those are areas that would still need to be uh, better defined or, or somehow uh, determine how you're going to meet those obligations. So you're more worried about the, the maintenance costs than the bond payments or the rebates? Well, the, the bond payments... Uh, they will continue um, at, a, at a slightly higher level, as has been discussed uh, previously, to about $3 million a year, which is slightly higher than what we've got today. Um, $3, three, as a, three million at, higher? No. It, it's basically what you're doing and is extending the debt on the dome debt, and so that's basically reducing some of the, in the front years. Um, so you'll still have that obligation. It's, it's, it's higher than what you've got today. But that, in and of itself, isn't going to isn't going to be the, the killer here. I, I I think I would be more concerned on the maintenance side uh, and how those those issues are eventually resolved. Uh, okay, uh, how concerned is, is is there a figure in mind that you think this to make? I would. We would. What kind of figure would you like to see in that fund if we if it was created? What the proper amount would be, I I, I couldn't I couldn't guess. Uh, I, I do know that there was a preservation amount set aside when we did the dome 20 years ago uh, where the, the state, city, and county uh, contributed four, and that was 20 years ago, and this is a more expensive stadium. So I, I imagine uh, uh, that it's going to be something north of that amount. Okay. Um, so uh, my quick question is, so French uh, spoke on the, uh, the uh, amusement tax. Uh, possibly being taken back, and it being what I think it was 1.8 million. 1.8 million is what we get now. And and from the NFL, it's 1.8 million to get back. So so would that create um, a hole for us to to fill? Um, I guess in a sense. If that happened, I mean, again, I think there's some illegal interpretation that uh, would have to uh, you'd have to come to, to to come to that conclusion. But obviously, if you lost 1.8 million dollars, yes, that would be, that would create a serious drag in our budget. And we'll have to pull that from GR, right? Yes, you would. Same as the uh, the maintenance and overruns, if there are any. Well, let me let me let me let me back up a bit. Um, my understanding is the abate the abatements are uh, predicated on the revenues that actually come in. So let's take your example of the $1.8 million that you don't receive. That would mean there would be a bigger, that would mean the, what's abated is 100% of nothing. Right. So uh, in that instance, the way it's written is that the state would have to cover for any shortfall of those particular bonds. And then they would come looking to us to make up from future revenues the gap that's created by that loss of revenue. Right. So we'll have to plug that from, from GR. Oh, okay. He said he has a minute to fix it. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um.
Alderman French, are, do you have an amendment? I do have some amendments. All oh, right. Would you? Uh, sure. <coughs> I'll give it to the uh, clerk here. I do. this amendment is, is intended to do? Okay. Uh, so this first amendment uh, is actually from uh, one of the bill sponsors. Uh, this would basically strike out any language uh, that is currently in the committee substitute um, that uh, describes an inclusion plan. Uh, amendments two and three uh, will add in the uh, negotiated inclusion plan. All right. And you're going to sponsor amendment number two and number three? Yes, we have those ready. Okay, I would move that we adopt amendment number one. Second. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt amendment number one. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman French? Aye. Alderman Vaccaro? Alderman Carter? Aye. Alderman Murphy? Aye. Alderman Ogilvie? Aye. Mr. President? Aye. Chairman Conway? Aye. We have nine ayes and no zeros. Amendment number one adopted. Alderman, proceed. Mr. Clerk. I don't have a. Okay. coming here. There you go. All right, so amendment number two, which is being distributed, uh, is the first of two amendments that actually add in uh, the negotiated uh, inclusion numbers. And I will go through a few of these once everybody has it. Okay, amendment number two, which is marked. Um, so first let me say that um, I appreciate um, the task force willingness um, to sit down with many of the members of this committee, uh, the president's office. Uh, we also uh, met often with uh, the labor unions um, to discuss uh, how to make this a project, should it happen, uh, that actually is uh, inclusive uh, and is one that actually can help put city residents to work, uh, minorities, um, women, uh, and to make this one of the most inclusive projects in the city of St. Louis history. Uh, our starting point uh, was really the findings of a St. Louis City disparity study uh, that was published uh, first part in April 2015 and the second part in June 2015. Uh, this is a study that was commissioned by the City of St. Louis and the St. Louis Development Corporation. Uh, in it, it, it was a long study, uh, and its findings, I think, were very important. Uh, what this study, which was actually performed by uh, Mason Tillman Associates, uh, what it found was that minority businesses uh, represent 30.51% of the available construction businesses, but have historically received just five 0.42% of all construction contracts. Uh, what it also showed was that city residents uh, have made up historically just uh, a few percentage points of the entire uh, labor force of many projects that were funded entirely by city dollars. Um, it also showed for the first time a real kind of census of the actual labor force that is available in the city of St. Louis. Um, and so what we did was base 
the numbers uh, in these amendments, these goals on this project, uh, we base them off the findings of uh, the disparity study. Now these disparity studies are available to the public, they're on the city's website. You really just have to Google St. Louis City Disparity Study and get these are very important documents that uh, really should be our guiding uh, principles in a lot of these development deals in the city now. So what this does is set, uh, let's just go look into the amendment. Um, starting on um, page four, uh, page four adds into the whereas clauses uh, a mention of the disparity study uh, and its findings. So it actually adds into the bill uh, showing that African Americans represent 27.5% of the available construction businesses, uh, Hispanics 1.8% uh, of the available construction businesses, MBEs, minority business enterprises 30.5%, um, women owned businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it goes into detail too on specifically the professional service businesses. Uh, what is the capacity uh, in the city of St. Louis for minority and women owned businesses? Uh, as you proceed to page five and six, um, on line 11 and page six, uh, it also found the underutilization of city residents in city construction projects, including findings that city residents make up just 23.28% of the labor hours worked on city construction projects. So what it lays out is the need, the need as uh, identified in this historic study that we did in the city of St. Louis. Uh, on page seven, it adds a section six to the bill. And section six is really the meat of uh, the participation goals. Um, and as, as I said, what it really does is, is you, seeks to use the disparity study to guide us in setting realistic uh, minority participation goals on city jobs. And in this way, I think this could be the first, this is, this is the first large project that we will have uh, done in the city of St. Louis uh, post the study. And so we use those numbers in this, in this, uh, in this actual language to set these goals based on that study. It sets a project participation goal, and I'm on page seven, uh, line 10. Sets a project participation goal for minorities of at least 37.81% of all labor hours. Now that is lifted directly from the disparity studies, the workforce study that shows uh, what the available labor force is uh, in the city of St. Louis. Sets a project participation goal of city residents at, 23, at at least 23.28% of all labor hours. Sets a project participation goal for women of at least 6.9% of all labor hours. Uh, and sets a goal of at least 30.51% of all construction prime dollars uh, going to companies owned by minorities. 30%, um, I'm, I'm on page eight now. 30% of all professional services um, uh, owned by minorities, 23.78% of all professional services owned by women, et cetera, et cetera. So what this does is uh, put into statute, at least for this project, uh, goals based on the disparity study of the city of St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of the sponsor of amendment number two? Okay. Alderman Kennedy. Alderman Kennedy. Let me uh, also. Yes. You guys have to use the microphones. Now he, he was saying, I thought he was. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, I'm passing out a, a summary sheet, too, that has these, uh, a summary of both amendments. So the, the first two parts of the amendment uh, talks about page one, line 19. Mm -hmm. Those are just clean up things. Correct. So. Um, <coughs> At the, beha at the uh, instructions of our uh, new and capable board attorney who is very helpful in drafting these amendments. Okay. Uh, what it does is strike out any mention of a, uh, the previous workforce inclusion plan. Okay. And is there, you have another amendment, is, is you have something related to compliance? Yes. Okay, all right. Okay. And then just for historical purpose, this is not the first um, study like this. Oh, yeah. This would be about the third. When was the last time? When was uh, the previous study? I believe, I know the comptroller, our comptroller then, Burgess Jones, did a study, and the city had done one. They were done 
concurrently with slightly different findings, but generally the same thing. So this would be about the third. Okay. We also at that time sponsored a minority participation bill, which couldn't get it passed mm -hmm. to reflect those numbers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Alderman uh, Merrill. Yes, Alderman French. I said, are these numbers you're speaking here, are these attainable currently? Yes. So one of the things uh, laid out, and I'll be happy to pass the study around, uh, what, this, what they did in the, uh, in the study, this commission by the city, is actually come up with um, percentages based on available workforce in the city. Uh, that's for uh, both um, women and minority workforce as well as women and minority um, uh, businesses. And so, uh, so often it's been said and anecdotally thrown around that there somehow just aren't enough workers to meet the goals. Uh, and what this study shows, and as Alderman Kennedy mentioned, um, as several studies have shown, is that the workforce are available. Uh, it's just about actually providing an incentive uh, and really a requirement uh, to, uh, to employ. Thank you. I would move that we adopt amendment number two. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt amendment number two. Previous roll. There's been a request for previous roll. Seeing no objection, amendment number two. Okay. Alderman French, you're recognized on amendment number three. All right. The clerk is passing out amendment number three. This one actually sets goals not just for workforce but also for um, the actual companies, subcontractors, contractors, uh, and provides incentives from the uh, from the total construction budget uh, to make sure that those businesses are successful. What many people may recall is that uh, a lot of the uh, MBEs and women-owned businesses that participated in the construction of the first dome. Um, aren't around anymore. That actually, that project um, killed a lot of them because it, you know, it, it, if you ever own a business, sometimes they tell you uh, no work is better than taking the wrong work. And so, what kills a lot of these businesses is um, not being able to extend um, payroll, uh, receiving payments late, um, not being able to have access to credit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, again, in consultation with uh, consultant attorneys, uh, members of the minority, contracting community, um, and even labor unions were helpful in this. We set some um, some incentives and some money aside to be able to help uh, with some of those businesses and to make sure that they're successful. Uh, starting on page four, it's really when you get into the meat of the uh, of the goals. Mm -hmm. This is amendment number three. Wait, this is amendment number three. I'm on amendment number three. Yeah. Where are you at? Hmm? What is it? Page 10. At the bottom? Okay. No, page, uh, yeah, I'm on page four. Four twelve. Yeah. Amendment number three. Amendment number three starts with um, page 
Oh, I'm referring to the actual minutes. Okay. 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 Uh, sets a project participation goal for city residents at 23.28% uh, of all labor hours. Uh, sets a goal of at least 30.51% of all construction prime contract dollars should go to companies owned by minorities. Uh, sets a goal of at least 12.23% of all construction prime contract dollars going to companies owned by women. Uh, sets a goal for 30% of all professional services prime contract dollars to go to companies owned by minorities. Sets a goal of at least 23.78% of all professional service contract dollars to go to companies owned by women, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things, again, these numbers come directly from the disparity st study and reflect what the capacity is in the city of St. Louis based on a study less than six months old. Uh, on page five, uh, it sets aside one million dollars from the construction budget for a quick pay program that ensures that minority and women-owned businesses do not experience cash flow problems while they get wait uh, while they wait to get paid. Uh, again, this is not extra money on top of the budget. This is just means that one million is set aside to pay people for what they have done, to pay companies for work that they perform in a timely manner. Um, Line four, page five, sets aside at least $5 million from the construction budget to guarantee loans to help smaller minority and women-owned businesses get lines of credit to help them fulfill their con contractual obligations uh, and for working capital. Uh, so what this would do is um, set aside $5 million that would guarantee loans. Now we imagine what this, uh, how this would work is that uh, the RSA would partner with a bank who would extend a line of credit, uh, but that line of credit is backed by $5 million from the loan. Uh, again, it's not extra money. Uh, it is uh, money that people have earned, uh, uh, and just to make sure that they have the line of credit to be able to fulfill their contractual allegations. So if somebody has received the contract to install all the toilets in the new dome, uh, they may need to apply for seven hundred or eight hundred thousand dollars of credit to buy all the toilets to install. Uh, smaller firms typically have a pro have trouble getting that kind of line of credit. So what we're saying is that um, to make it easier, in partnership with the bank, uh, that line of credit will be backed by us. Uh, so that is not extra money. We imagine that you know there it will be a very high repayment um, percentage. But if there is a the, the only cost that that would generate is if there is a, um, uh, a default on the loan. And we don't imagine that that would be very high. But it is still in the best interest, I think, of the public to make sure that these companies succeed and that uh, they aren't taking work that's actually going to kill their business. Uh, sets aside $500,000 from the construction budget to provide back office and technical assistance to minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, this was... Um, I think this number is about the same number that was agreed to in the thing that was handed out last at our last meeting. Sets aside $500,000 of construction budget to assist uh, in the payment of professional services, including legal and accounting. Again, these are things that uh, are typically uh, points of pain for smaller businesses, minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, provides opportunities for minority and female journeymen and other minority and female workers entering unions through apprenticeships who live in the city of St. Louis with priority given to participants who reside in U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development designated promise zones in the city of St. Louis. Uh, previous language uh, gave preference to, the, to people who live in the entire promise zone area, which also includes areas of St. Louis County, but as we know, St. Louis County is not contributing to this project. So we say give preference to uh, the city residents. This is on what page? Page five. Uh, that was on line 16 of page five. Good morning. Um, so I would categorize this section as being um, in the section that really is about uh, trying to make sure that we are bringing in new people into the workforce. Um, 
requires contractors to award contracts value, um, awarded contractors valued at more than $300,000 in labor content uh, to hire one new apprentice residing in the, in the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development designated promise zone in the city of St. Louis. For every additional $500,000 in contract value above $300,000, contractors are responsible for hiring one additional new apprentice. Uh, this is also based on language that was provided to us um, at the last meeting uh, by the task force. Uh, and, um, and what we did, though, was uh, actually working with the, the unions. Uh, it, it, didn't, it did not before explicitly say that uh, the three hundred thousand dollars was for labor content. It just said three hundred thousand dollars in contract value. And what uh, what was pointed out um, and makes a lot of sense is that uh, some contracts are for mostly materials, and so it's hard to hold them accountable uh, for when it's not labor. I'm, so, I'm being told to wrap up. So uh, I, I could have read it for you. Uh, yeah. So anyway, if you have any questions, I'll answer them. This basically helps with the compliance aspect. Yes. And that's the, a significant portion of what we were looking for. Are there any questions for Alderman French? I, I have, have Alderman Kennedy. On, on the prom, so this, <laughs> this portion here is all new language as it relates to the promise form? Yes. So, that, um, so before there was uh, a handout passed out, I don't know, somebody may have that, mm -hmm. you might have that. Uh, that these were some things that the task force had worked out and said they agreed to, but there was never a language in the bill that actually said that. So that, uh, that handout before mentions the promise zones, right. but that was never actually in the bill. And so this reflects that same thing that was in that handout? Correct. Right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move that we adopt amendment number three. Second. Previous row. Second, that we adopt amendment number three. There's been a request for previous row. Seeing no objection, amendment number three passes. Alderwoman Murphy. Uh, yes, I would like to introduce, I guess it's amendment four, and it will be passed out. And basically what amendment four says is that it's, um, we would like inserted in the NFL uh, team lease a provision that would um, require them to relocate their practice facility and headquarters in the city within five years. I believe it's currently in Earth City or something uh, uh, like that. It would give them about five years, give them five years to relocate the practice facility somewhere within the city limits and their headquarters. And of course, this would be contingent upon redevelopment package that the city perhaps would provide using historic preservation tax credits and brownfield tax credits and whatnot. Uh, to enhance the uh, ability of them to build that. Um, Alderman, yeah. he says require them to relocate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there any um, places for them to be able to go, or do we? I mean, to require is a pretty significant thing. I thought that, that the concept was was to provide additional tax incentives to, to make it maybe more, uh, to, to make it. Mm -hmm. I would think that the city, with all, the, all of its uh, vacant properties and whatnot, would be able to come up with something within the city limits that would be large enough that we could accommodate them using brownfield tax credits and historic tax credits. If there's any one specific site, I'm not sure of. I've heard a couple uh, mentioned, but nothing specific. Encourage instead of require. That so that therefore, if, if the, the key thing is that the players practice in the city. Uh, yes, because then we would of course get all the. Uh, uh, we would get more earnings taxes, taxes. More earnings taxes and things like that. That was where I was going with this. But if we don't require them to do it, what's the incentive for them not to just stay? Well, if you provide incentives and work with them. 
Mm -hmm. You know, that would be the, the incentive. But that's not really in front of us. I would prefer, and I, and I can support it, that the lease encourages um, the NFL team instead of requires. Now, I, I think I would like to, them to be required to do it. Otherwise, they... Uh, the meeting will come back to order. Everybody, please take their seats. Committee members. Alderwoman Murphy, you're recognized to withdraw Amendment Number Four. Um, I would like to withdraw Amendment Four at this time. All right. Um, President Reed. I think he said that you want me to go grab. Them. Yes, he has two amendments here. Let me grab. Is it his? Conway's going to put put in a tip somewhere along the line for all of this. Right, right. I don't think he's going to let us. In, in Alderwoman Berenger, could you see that that door, the doors get closed for me, please? Thank you. I don't even think Steve's going to read it. President Reed, you're recognized on amendment number five. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, amendment five clears up some language in the bill uh, and adds a level of transparency to the bill that currently is. I don't have amendment five in front of me. Uh, he's passing it. Clerk is passing it out right now. So starting at page, starting on page eight of um, of the committee substitute line four, we want to strike out by the, uh, by the mayor and insert um, by the board, you know, the St. Louis Board of ENA, because then it would be more transparency. Those meetings are taped and recorded. Uh, 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 the public can show up to those meetings if they like and watch, watch the hearings. So we believe that it would add more transparency to the process in terms of amending the agreement in the, in the future. And then it goes on to begin on line eight, page eight, line 13, where we will also strike out by the mayor and insert in line thereof the words to read as following by the St. Louis Board of ENA. Amendment number five. I move that we adopt amendment number five. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt amendment number five. Previous Are there any roll. questions previous for the sponsor? No. There's been a request for previous roll. Seeing no objection, amendment number five is adopted. Okay. Are there any other amendments? All right. Hey, I, uh, yes. I, uh, I'm going to make a motion uh, that we adopt Amendment 6, okay. whose language is identical to Amendment 4. Oh. Which amendment? Oh. 
I could be so kind to have the clerk distribute them out at six. Thank you. Okay. So he's made a motion to adopt amendment number six, which is exact same language as amendment number four. Which I don't have. Which was withdrawn, yes. I don't see a second. I don't, see, I don't have it. Well, you've got number four. He said the language is exactly the same as number four that was withdrawn. Is anybody seconding amendment number six? Okay, it fails for a one to second. Are there any other amendments? I have a couple amendments on the lease to clear up some language on the lease agreement. Okay, Mr. President, proceed. First one is on page five of the Prime Act. Page five. Yeah, uh, no, of the of the financing and lease and lease agreement. Yeah. Financing agreement. This is yeah, this page. Actually, let's go. To, let's start out on page six. This would be page six. First amendment. Page six of which which thing, Mr. President? Of the of the financing agreement. Page six. Yeah, of the Proceed. financing and construction lease agreement. Page six. If you go down to now, the pages aren't numbered, so it's a little difficult. I mean, the line items aren't numbered, but if you go to the very first paragraph, starting. Let's <coughs> Against the yeah, but we don't have it yet. <laughs> 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 Mr. President. All right. And the, on the top paragraph, fourth sentence, uh, halfway through that paragraph, it says, it starts out, if the city takes any action that would cause any of the foregoing sales taxes to no longer be imposed or reduced, the rate of any such sales tax uh, below the rate in effect, in effect of, on the date of this agreement. And then it goes on to the end of the paragraph. So th what, what this amendment does is it changes that paragraph so that so that it it makes it in cases it only holds the city accountable if it's a voluntary action. So it changes changes it to say that if the city takes any voluntary action after the date of this agreement. In the original I move that we adopt amendment number seven. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt amendment number seven. Quick Alderman question. Carter. And so my question is, is so since we won't be on the hook, who who will be? Uh, we've talked to the we've talked to the attorneys, uh, and I guess the courts would decide that. We could, only thing that we need to make sure that the city is protected, in case the courts would come back and say that uh, you know the NFL is not. Respond, the city cannot charge the amusement. So this could just possibly be on the hook for the state? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Seeing no further questions, it's been moved and second that uh, Amendment Number 7 pass. There's been a request for previous roll. Seeing no objection, Amendment Number 7. Mr. President, anything else?
piles and piles and piles of copies up here, so we're wading through all these copies. All right. This is amendment number eight, and this one's back to page five where we started. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, Mr. President, please proceed. And this, this goes on to continue to clean up that language. <coughs> uh, if you go to the second paragraph from the bottom, uh, it starts out with, you know, where it's underlined, you'll see in the paragraph, if the city takes any action that would cause any of the foregoing taxes to no longer be imposed or reduced, the rate at, of any such tax below, and then it continues there throughout the balance of that paragraph. Uh, it would, we, this amendment would substitute that language to say, if the city takes any voluntary action after the date of this agreement. So it would, again, uh, shift the onus so that the city would have to take a voluntary action uh, to, uh, to change that tax. All right. I move that we adopt amendment number eight. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Previous roll. Request for previous roll. Is this your last one, Mr. President? That's it. Okay. Yes, Alderwoman Hubbard, you're recognized to close on board committee substitute for board bill 219. Oh, excuse me. Um, bear with me for one second. Hmm? I have so much paper. Okay. Alderman, let me see what you have here. I need the top one. I need the top one. Let's see what we have here. Okay, who, who, who's doing this? Okay, hold on for a second. Okay. These are for me. Um, who, who's taking care of these? Uh, Alderman French. Alderman French. Are these all common and the same in, in what they're focusing on? I believe so. All right. If you'll give me an overview when you do the first one, Amendment Number Nine, please make a motion. We have to decide which one's Number Nine. Uh, you want to just well, it's not that relevant. He said it's not relevant. Okay, we'll just do this one. Mr. Deskin, can you come up? Where's he at? Yeah. We don't have any. We don't have any down. He's deciding which one to do first. He's got to pass. Um, the one that says uh, to amend Exhibit A uh, of said board bill, page 13. So, uh, Mr. Deskin, <laughs> can you explain these amendments? These are uh, uh, um, what we're giving them here. here. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, amendment 9 um, changes um, page 13 of Exhibit A um, and section 3.1D uh, to add some additional provisions on voting inside the RSA on the NFL football lease. As you know, the RSA is composed of commissioners appointed by the state, by the county, as well as the city. And this provision maximizes the participation of those commissioners on the RSA appointed by the city or appointed by the state as city residents on any decision on the NFL lease. So, uh, so what uh, Amendment 9 uh, it does is strike the section that says that the authority uh, agrees it will not enter into a binding commitment or agreement. Uh, 
unless a minimum of two city approved commissioners uh, and a minimum of three state appointed commissioners voted in favor of the NFL lease. Correct. And you, in this new language, does what? What it does first is it requires approval of a majority of the commissioners appointed by the state and by the city. It takes the county out. So first level is a majority of the, those commissioners appointed by the funding agencies. Point two, it retains a minimum of two of the city appointed commissioners. There'll be three, so at least two have to vote. And in third, there is one of the commissioners appointed by the state who must be a city resident. And so it will require at least one of those commissioners to also approve. So it, maybe this, maybe. it maximizes city participation along with the states in the decision to approve the lease. And what is the practical effect of that? It, uh, it, it prevents um, the yeah. city representatives being outvoted? Correct. Uh, if you think about it, the, the state appoints five of the 11. The county appoints three. So if you take um, Obviously three of the county and three from the, the state, they can make a decision without any city input. Okay. This requires city input. Uh, I'm sorry, could you identify yourself? <laughs> My name is Larry Deskins. I'm with the law firm of Lewis Rice, LLC. Thank you. I have a question. Okay, Alderman Ogilvy, you right. go ahead. Thanks. The, the RSA is a state-created entity, is it not? Yes. And I would assume that all 11 voting members assume when they are appointed that their votes count equally, don't they? <laughs> yes. So what? Again, I mean, this, this clearly isn't bad for us, you know, at the city level, but why do we think we can instruct, we can curtail what a state-created entity can do, what the commissioners of that state-created entity can do? But it's state-created, but it's funded 50% by the state. 25% by the city and by the county in the normal course of events. In this project, <coughs> this stadium is going to be funded by the city and by the state and not by the county. And yeah, so I mean, it, it, it presents an odd situation and one probably not contemplated at the time of the creation of the RSA. It's, it's just interesting because the RSA just took us to court at the city level to say, hey, you can't tell us what to do. And they prevailed in that lawsuit. So here we are again telling them how they can operate. And I, I would. Uh, no, we are not. I'm sorry. We're not telling the RSA how they have to operate. They're entering into an agreement with the city and they are agreeing to operate in accordance with these provisions. This is a voluntary action by the RSA. And a majority of the RSA is gonna to have to approve it in all likelihood. So it's a voluntary action. If I, w if I was one of the members of the RSA whose, whose vote was being negated by this component of uh, the agreement here, the financing agreement, I would probably go to court and I would say, look, you, you've reduced my rights as a commissioner of the RSA that I had when I was appointed to this body. This is not, uh, it's not legal. You can't, you know, we couldn't, it's, it's no different than a group of us saying, look, only the votes of these eight aldermen count, but not the votes of the other 20 aldermen on this particular issue. I, 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 I understand, like, the intent here is so that somebody can go out and say, hey, look, don't worry, when we get to the lease phase, it'll be the city appointed people making the decision because we're paying for it, so don't get too worked up about that. But the fact is, you know, I think this really stretches uh, quite far um, the limits of, you know, what 
this, how the city can instruct a state agency to operate. Okay, I think that was an observation. Or is there, I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, where, where, can you give me uh, a corollary of some place where the city or the county or any municipal entity has been able to instruct a state appointed board in how their commissioners can operate and take votes? I'm not sure that I can. Because <coughs> I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for. Okay. Any Thank agency. You. Okay. Thank you, Alderman. President Reed. Yes. Uh, first, I want to just make sure it's clarified that uh, uh, Larry was retained to work with, work with us to clarify language within the bill. Uh, he has an extensive background uh, with the Sports Commission and um, you know, is a very good attorney. So he did a great job of going through the bill, making sure to highlight some of those things that may be a challenge in the future. Uh, and I know the, the uh, alderman uh, from the 21st Ward, um, uh, after looking at all the amendments, we may look to take these up uh, on the floors. But you were saying, right. uh, <laughs> if there, unless unless there um, is any um, <coughs> any objection to that. Okay, and, and then Larry, is, I'd love to have lunch with you Monday or Tuesday, <laughs> and then you can give me a little bit more background on how that all works. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. We. Um, so I think that that's it. <coughs> so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hold these four amendments and then we're gonna take them up on, on the floor. Okay. Yeah. I withdraw the amendment. Yeah. Alderwoman Hubbard. You are recognized to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I'd just like to say that I know that we all have exhausted a lot of energy in trying to bring forth the best deal and the best financing package. Um, it's, it's been a lot of work on both sides, and I would just like to have you all's favorable consideration of Board Bill 219 so that we may move forward. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to move that we adopt committee substitute for board bill 219 after it gets moved and seconded. Everybody will have 10 minutes to speak their mind. Um, I move that we adopt committee substitute for board bill 219. Second. Alderman Kennedy. Point, point of order, can make sure that motion is in, in order that it's committee substitute as amended? Add the words amended. Alderman Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, there are, I have some sincere concerns about the bill. Uh, I was not one that uh, supported the dome. I was here at the time. I did not vote in support of it because I had serious <laughs> issues with how that was constructed. Uh, the city was put on the hook and uh, in several years had to struggle to find ways to pay for it. So I had very serious concerns with it. I have serious concerns with this one as well. Um, I'm not saying I have a bunch of questions, I have some, some very serious concerns. I certainly appreciate the efforts that were made to, uh, to shore up and improve and, and make sure that the minority participation portions were incorporated into the bill itself and not just a a uh, verbal statement uh, that we're going to do this and some supportive paperwork that's not really incorporated into the law. That is significant. As you know, I sponsored the, the, the first um, minority business and women business enterprise bill here based upon studies that were done by the city in the early 90s. So that is significant that it is in the bill uh, and of a project of this size uh, that is certain, certainly historical. Um, and I do appreciate that. Uh, also, I, I, at the same time, I believe that the bill merits 
a larger discussion with the Board of Aldermen than just this committee. Uh, I have found out through the years that um, when there are significant and important bills like this, uh, it merits uh, having all 28 or 29 people with the president having an opportunity to have an open discussion on it and to be able to vote their opinions about it. So one part of me could support it coming out of committee to allow that discussion, um, but I don't necessarily see myself supporting it even if it gets out onto the floor. But I could support it at this point getting out of committee for a larger discussion. Uh, with members of the board, at least that's how I'm feeling right now. Uh, based upon uh, what I saw happen with the dome, it did not take the city into a financial deficit. But uh, I, my concerns then earlier was that the city rolled over and made all kind of flips trying to make sure that a football team remained in the city of St. Louis, and that was not one of my highest priorities. So I, I really just wanted to take this as an opportunity to give some of my reflections. Uh, based upon uh, the discussions that have happened so far. I do appreciate, again, the aldermen uh, who worked on particularly those minority participation pieces that strengthened this bill and made it, in my opinion, worth having a larger discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alderman Kennedy. Alderman Moore. When a judge can rule against the will of the people and take their voting rights away from them, it is amazing to me. It's the first time in my life that I have seen voting rights took, took from white people. I'm saying that you join the club. We've had our voting rights taken for many years. And now here we are in St. Louis in the year 2015 in the Android world and you got one man ruling that you don't have the right to vote on your taxes, your tax dollars for a $2 billion stadium for a group of losers who don't want to be here. It is the first time. So this is history we're making. You're sitting in on history. I've been warned. I've been lobbied. At this point, yeah. By any and everybody and their representatives trying to get this my vote. I didn't get the, the information I needed. I might abstain because I don't have the information. Someone should be really running and trying to get me that information if you want my vote today or if you want me to abstain on this because I want to know where this money is going, how much money has been spent, and the other information that I asked you for. But I still do not believe that any job, not a penny, is going to come to the fourth ward, going to come to my constituents. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. We're going to get nothing if we don't pass the stadium. We're going to get nothing when it pass. And it will pass. Mm. If you use jobs as a bait to entice anyone to come in, you're great fishermen. You tell a whale of a tales. You fish with the bait of a job, 3,500 jobs you we're going to get, or however how many jobs you say we're going to get. But they won't come to my community. We don't have the experience. You're not going to put them in those apprenticeship programs that you've been promises, promises, promises. These are fairy tales that will never come true. Never will they come true. But we're going to take a chance on this. Because we get nothing, I've been promised something, so if I vote no, I get nothing. And we're being threatened to get something, so we, we might as well go vote in favor of this bill. Just give me a moment. I also asked who's going to pay for the old stadium. I haven't got that answer yet. And on the naming rights, since we don't have national anymore, if we don't have national, who's going to pay the additional money that they were going to pitch in on, the, the, uh, on, the, on our bill that we're going to receive? Don't get it twisted. This stadium is not on the north side. It's downtown St. Louis. 
the trouble is on the north side. That's, that's the stigma about the north side. So it's not the north side. You wouldn't dare build a stadium on the north side. And if you build another facility, building in my ward where I have 1,700 vacant lots, we put those together, we can build you anything you want. And come on over to the north side, the other side of St. Louis, and see how we live in that side of town. The city can find any money they want, any time they want, to develop and the resources. Of course but you need to spend the resources on the people, the forgotten people in that fourth war. I wish I had brought my pictures in to show some of you how we live. Some of you don't know how we live because you won't come in there and see. But it is horrendous and horrific. It's terrible third world living. And I will always say that we live like the Flintstones compared to the Jetsons. Yabba dabba do, but we're not having a gay old time. It's horrible in there where we live in the city, another side of St. Louis that you should see. Let's get a tour bus and take all of you in, in this room to my ward. Next week we'd have to perfect. And you would all encourage your, your, your leadership to, to vote no on this stadium. But they say I'm going to get something. They say we might get a few jobs. I doubt if we get 10. But 10 is better than none at all. Because we have absolutely nothing in the city of St. Louis, apartheid, polarized, no, two cities, north and south. We're talking about building a stadium for some losers. But we have to have enforcement. We have to have monitors to enforce what they say they're going to do for us. I'm still waiting on them coats. Everyone has an agenda. And they don't consider your or care about yours. I have an agenda, and that is to take care of the forgotten people in the fourth ward, to make sure that we get something out of the deal for our tax and our vote. That vote is a foreign piece of currency. You cannot buy anything with the vote on the north side. I'm saddened by this whole charade. I wish I wasn't on this committee so I could duck out like the rest of my colleagues. But we're here. And I need that information. So I was going to vote no. I might vote yes, and I, I might abstain if I don't get that information, Otis. Is it behind me? <laughs> I abstain. <laughs> Alderman, Alderman French. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, so this has been a busy last few weeks trying to put together uh, some agreements that would actually make this a, a project that we if it happens, that we can feel proud of and that would actually put people to work in the city of St. Louis. Um, so I appreciate the task force uh, that at the last committee hearing really empowered us to uh, sit down and put together whatever we felt would be an inclusive package to deal with minority participation. And I think what we have now included in this bill is really a, a template and a model for all of the future projects. And it's based on actual numbers. It's based on what actually can be done. Uh, now, it has always been three issues for me related to this bill. Number one is to use this as, as an opportunity uh, to make sure that the mayor took the crime situation in the city very seriously and to sit down with us finally to put, put together a comprehensive crime plan for St. Louis. Uh, we have met several times with the mayor's office. Uh, the mayor's chief of staff and I uh, have crafted together what I think is uh, a very good strategy moving forward for the city to deal with those neighborhoods that represent uh, the bulk of violent crime in the city of St. Louis. Uh, we are 99% there. Uh, there's still a, a couple of things that need to be done, um, but I will take the mayor's chief of staff uh, for her word that we will complete that in the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, the second thing was with regard to minority participation. 
um, and to make sure that if we're going to do this, we do it in a way that everybody gets its fair share of participation and representation in the jobs that will be given out on this project. I think the inclusion plan that we have adopted today does that. Uh, and the third has been to make sure that we don't sign a deal and enter into an agreement that will make us go broke. Um, there have been some changes to the bill in the last couple of days uh, that have raised some questions for me about the financial consequence for the city. Um, having the budget director come up today to talk a little bit about some of his concerns was helpful in that regard. Uh, and so, um, like Alderman Kennedy, uh, I feel like we've done enough progress um, that I can support this on the committee level. Um, but I still think that we need to do some due diligence before final passage of the full board related mostly to category three, which is to make sure that we've protected the city's financial interest. Um, so that's it. Alderman Carl. I'll keep a chart. I agree 100% with my colleagues. I think it should come out of committee. I think I learned my lesson when I didn't want the minimum wage to come out that they overruled me anyway on the floor and it came out. So, you know, obviously there's changes that were made today. There'll be changes that'll be made on the floor. And I, I plan to vote this out of committee. And then we just see where it goes on the floor. But every step we take has had a positive change. It's had changes to protect different groups. You know, and I agree with Alderman French. The next is to make sure the city's protected and to pass out the best possible bill that we can pass. To sit down and say that we're for or against, I think as the original bill came out, I don't think it would have had the votes anywhere on, on any of us over here. But to sit down and say we were against or we are against something that hasn't even been completed yet is wrong. I think as we sit down and this bill makes changes, and when we see the final version of what this bill is, then I think the majority of us will be able to make an intelligent decision. I'm going to say no. Alderman Carter. Yes. Um, first, I want to uh, applaud uh, my colleagues uh, for working on this, uh, Alderwoman Hubbard and Alderman Kotar, um, on uh, all of the work that they did to, uh, to bring this forth. Um, so I I'm not going to repeat some of the stuff that my colleague said, but I do agree uh, with something that my uh, senior alderman, uh, Alderman Kennedy, and um, and some stuff that uh, Alderman French said. Um, and so, yeah, senior to me. <laughs> um, and so, there was a lot of great things that we did uh, on this bill. I think that the minority uh, inclusion plan is. Uh, is one in its own. I think that it is very exceptional, and I want to thank uh, Alderman French, uh, Louis Reed, uh, Jeff Abusi, Sam Moore, uh, the Carpenters, plumber, Plumbers and Pipe Fitters, and uh, everybody that put their heads together to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, we did a lot of work on it, and I think that we came out with the best uh, possible uh, inclusion plan. And so um, I, like many others, still have a long list of questions that um, have not been answered. Um, I don't agree with a uh, number of projections uh, that were used. Um, I think that they were uh, semi-inflated to uh, sell this. And, um, you know, like, I mean, I just believe uh, overall that, uh, well, I made a commitment to my ward and to my residents. Um, a, a, a while ago that I would uh, fight for them and uh, fight for a vote uh, just in terms of a, of a public vote uh, in this. And so uh, I'm a man of my word and I promised them that I would not vote on this unless if we had, uh, you know, a public vote. So I'm going to probably be the only no. Um, so I'm going to stand with that. Thanks. 
Councilwoman Murphy. Uh, yes, um, I, uh, my constituents have the same um, concerns about crime as uh, Alderman French mentioned. And uh, so I was very glad that you're working close with the mayor's office and that we you know, can come to some sort of agreement addressing that issue. That's very important to my constituents. I also concur with Alderman, Alderman Kennedy that the b bill of this magnitude deserves to be the full consideration of the board. And therefore, I will vote for this bill to be passed. Alderman Ogilvy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I am, I am truly appalled by the charade that has happened, pretending to defend a law that city residents enacted by an initiative petition in 2002. Um, you know, I, I, I would characterize what has happened as a conspiracy between the RSA, the mayor's office, and the governor's office to eliminate that law. Um, what I've seen is a just an utter disdain, I think, for a legally enacted law by residents of, of St. Louis. Um, you know, an utter disdain for the will of the people. And I think it's appalling. Um, it, it has been an entirely uh, reasonable expectation for citizens of St. Louis to get to weigh in on 35 years of, of debt and debt payments for a want, something that I don't think anybody in this room can characterize as a need. Um, and it's a shame because what that's going to continue to do is just undermine voters' confidence in us, in City Hall, in, in whether or not we have them in mind when we <coughs> make decisions. Um, I, I think many of the arguments for this bill are just specious. You know, the idea that the idea that you can create jobs for a couple years and then pay for those jobs with interest payments on the debt for 35 years, um, you know, honestly, it's not particularly smart or savvy from a financial perspective. Every job that we create for those two years uh, is likely going to mean somebody at City Hall, a city employee, 10 years down the road, does not have a job because we're pulling money out of general revenue uh, to pay for those upfront jobs. You know, 2015 is going to see St. Louis have the highest homicide rate in the country. Um, we got a mortgage on City Hall West, on another City Hall building. We had to borrow money on that building to buy property. We got a balcony in this room we can't allow people uh, into. We got the budget director's office that uh, leaks water because um, the roof, can't, fi can't afford to fix the roof at City Hall. And, you know, those are just some highlights. The list of things we need to pay for is dozens of pages long that we don't have the money to pay for. Otherwise, we'd do it. We'd fix it if we have the money. Um, you bring these things up, and the most common response is, sure, but we can't afford to do that. Um, you know, the, the idea that this is going to merely be a two or three million dollar obligation on the part of the city uh, over these 35 years is just, it's, it, it's just not true. Um, you have to account for what it's going to take to maintain the Edward Jones Dome. Uh, you have to account for what it will likely take to maintain this new facility. Um, we see every time somebody builds a, builds a stadium, we're going to be paying for it for 35 years, but uh, I can predict uh, very accurately that the team will show up in 15 or 20 years and say, you know what, we need a bunch of other upgrades to this facility, so here, why don't you go bond another 60 or 70 million dollars uh, so we can make sure that we have the best game day experience for the fans. <sighs> you know, I, I think <laughs> I think voting, I, I just think this is based on a number of fictions. You know, the fiction that 50, retaining 50 full-time jobs, which is the of official estimate, is worth 35 years of debt payments totaling over $400 million for 50 full-time jobs. The fiction that we here in, in City Hall can dictate to the state how they are going to appropriate money in the future. Fiction, the fiction that the Edward Jones Dome, we're just going to miraculously create new money 
to continue to maintain a facility uh, that we've paid off. The fiction that a 35-year financial liability is actually an investment. That's an investment. It's, it's not an investment. It's a liability. Um, the fiction that we can enter into an agreement to make payments to the RSA for 35 years and they can't walk eight blocks from their office to come talk to us about it even once. Find out what they do. It is utterly irresponsible for us to do this. We're entering into a 35 year agreement with the RSA and they never appeared. The CBC was never here. They are likely to manage this facility like they manage the Edward Jones Dome. CBC has not come to any hearings. I, did, I will say in their defense, they sent me a letter when I talked to them this week with, with some details. But nobody from the RSA. Um, you know, the, the fiction that the city will not be responsible for cost overruns, the, the fiction that the city will not be responsible for maintenance and operations. It is just, it, it's clear to me that when it's all said and done, um, we'll be pulling between the Edward Jones Dome and, and a new stadium, we'll easily be pulling 10 plus million dollars out of general revenue every year. And 10 million is not a trivial number. You know, 10 million is the, the 30 or 40 homicide detectives that we need. It's the additional prosecutors we need. It's the money to maintain the real-time intelligence center that we just opened that uh, just this week I was told we don't have the money to maintain on an ongoing basis. Uh, it's the money to increase the three cameras we have in North St. Louis uh, that are designed to fight crime. Three cameras, highest homicide rate in the country. We got three cameras and we got no funding right now to purchase more. Um, I think this is a radical departure both from what residents of this city are asking of us and of, of truly what our priorities should be. You know, Detroit has a stadium downtown. The city helped pay for that stadium which opened in 2002. They got a Super Bowl a few years later and lo and behold the whole city went bankrupt uh, just a few years after hosting that Super Bowl. What happens in a municipal bankruptcy? Well, a bunch of people lost their pensions. Uh, the city can't afford to keep the water on for tens of thousands of residents. You know, these things are not trivial. When you tie up more and more money in long-term debt payments, you have no flexibility on, on what to do. Um, you know, we should probably pay attention to the fact that if you look at the long-term trends in the city, the long-term credit ratings, financial outlook, none of them are good. The city has a declining population, a declining tax base. Um, you know, spending money on things that are non-essential when we have an enormous backlog of things that are essential to spend money on is the wrong policy. And it's not only the wrong policy, but we've, we've gotten at this point in what I would characterize a, as a very disingenuous manner. Um, so I, I, I still hold out a little bit of hope that when this gets to the floor, uh, we come to our senses and vote no. Because what we're, if we approve this, what's going to happen, this, is, this will be the best we get. And if we end up with a team owner who is interested in building a stadium here, the deal will only get worse going forward. It will only get worse. The stadium will cost more, and we'll end up picking up the tab for that. The lease terms may be unfavorable. You know, even within this financing agreement is we're contemplating, well, we're gonna need additional things like community improvement districts and TIFs to actually pay for this thing. We're probably not even acknowledging the full cost within this financing agreement. So, I hope you come to our, our senses and vote no. Thank you. Well, first, I'd just like to thank the members of this committee uh, for all of the hard work you've done uh, across the time that you've had this bill. And, and also to all the residents that have been involved with this um, thing from the beginning. Uh, I think that there's a general 
uh, consensus that it would have been great if we had an opportunity, the constituents, including myself, my wife, and my son, and others, had an opportunity to vote. Um, it was a shame that the city of St. Louis, the residents of the city of St. Louis, did not have an opportunity to vote on this thing. Um, but given where we are now, and if we take a look at some of the crime numbers and public safety numbers that we continue to have to wade our way through every year. And then we say, why isn't things getting better? Well, we, we know that when we change the economic conditions of families, we know that when we uh, empower kids and give them an opportunity for careers, it can dramatically change that child's life and it dramatically changes those families' lives. So I'm not voting on this thing today because I'm a Rams football fan. Matter of fact, I rarely catch a football game because generally you're out in the community working on neighborhood and community things on Sunday. But um, I'm voting on it because I want to give people throughout our city who have not had a chance, who have not had careers, an opportunity for a chance, an opportunity for careers. You know, Nancy Reagan said, just say no. And today we're telling them, just put down the pistol. Just don't, just don't engage on black on black crime and all these other things. But we're not saying yes to a paycheck. We're not saying yes to a career. We're not giving these opportunities that the families and the people across the city needs. This minority inclusion, minority and women owned business community uh, inclusion plan that was put together in this bill is something that I've never seen throughout my time in public service. I think it can make a dramatic difference in the lives of people all across the city and the people that need it most. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of the folks, the my friends of mine that, uh, that are opposing uh, this bill and we rarely, I don't think, I can't think of a time that we've been on different sides. But I'm asking you and I'm asking others to look past where we would normally be on an issue like this and let's try to work to create some of these opportunities for these kids and the families that are suffering every day. You know, like most of you in this room, I enjoy a job, right? Like most of you in this room, I, you know, I have to struggle from paycheck to paycheck on bills and, and everything else. Now, we think that's tough that we have to do that, but take away that paycheck so you have nothing. So you have to go beg, borrow, and steal to get to, to, get to something so that your kids don't have what they need to get to school and you know that you know that if you can take them out of that environment and take them into something better you could change their lives and they will not have to go through what you went through put yourself in the shoes of that mother and father that's dealing with that every day and as an elected official if i have an opportunity to change their lives to change to to impact that family i'm going to take it and I think that this plan, for the first time, gives us that opportunity because one of the things that we always do at this Board of Aldermen, we vote on it and we say, okay, go ahead, go down the road, do the right thing. That is not the case in this bill. In this bill, we vote on it and we say, guess what? There's going to be regular monitoring and guess what? There's going to be a committee at the Board of Aldermen that's looking into everything that you're doing and we're going to make sure that you're doing the right things and we're working to make sure that people are being hired and if we do not do that, we're going to do another disparity study 10 years from now and the numbers are going to be exactly the same. People wonder why the numbers don't change and the numbers can continue to be the same is because we have not, the ordinances have to be enacted with the penalties and the clawbacks and everything else in it to assure that the right thing is done. And that's where we are on this one. And again, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and you know everyone else that's here today, uh, 
I appreciate everything that everybody's done on this thing, everybody on both sides, because I think we come to our best solutions when it's a blended solution. We need all voices to be heard so that we can blend those things together to try to come up with something that would best represent the wishes and the things of the city of St. Louis. So I know that if I was to ask my wife, my wife would say, don't vote on it. Her and I had this discussion all night last night, had this discussion this morning. And it wasn't until I walked her through the minority and women-owned business inclusion plan that she said, oh, that's a good deal, and I think you should vote on it. I'm looking forward to working on this plan. I'm looking forward to seeing people employed and, and earn careers that, that have always been left out of the equation. So with that, I'm going to support this uh, bill today. Thank you, Mr. President. I voted with Alderman Kennedy 20 years ago <laughs> against that last stadium because to me economically it didn't make sense. The city's commitment was 25 percent. Mm -hmm. In this package, and it's very complicated, and when you have all of these complicated details um, and the different parties and, and the people of interest, um, you have a lot of facts, words stringing out there that people who are against it can, can dwell on and say, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. A billion dollar project is incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. The difference between 20 years ago and today is the city's on the hook for 7.5%. The other funds come out of revenues that we would not otherwise receive if we didn't have a stadium. This arrangement is not like the field of dreams. If the NFL does not give us a 30-year deal, put in their money, the state of Missouri doesn't put in their money, it doesn't get built. <coughs> Many of the arguments that we're hearing is it's costing us all this money. We're not building it unless they come. And the way I kind of look at it, you know, it, it, and, I, and I know different people will um, disagree with how the numbers work, and I've gone through every number, every component of the numbers that would go into Noel's spreadsheets and look at them and ask questions. Thank you. You look at that area of the North Riverfront. When you drive over the Stan Usual Bridge, you see those 50 vacant buildings. Welcome to St. Louis. It's contaminated. It's hazardous. No one here today has a plan to redevelop that. You know why? Because it's not economically feasible. If we were to take all of our CBD uh, uh, community development agency monies for the next 10 years, which is not a practical thing, maybe we could do something with our front door here in the city of St. Louis. As a byproduct, or actually one of the major considerations I have, we will fix up our front door. We will create 35 acres of Riverfront Park. And when you look at the major cities around this country, you always take advantage of your natural resources. That is the mighty Mississippi River, and it looks like junk. We're spending $380 million to fix up around the arch. <coughs> We're getting that fixed up in, in conjunction with the, the bicycle trails that run along the Mississippi River. We're creating a use not just for people who go to football games, but for every single person in the city and in this region. The city, we offer a cacophony of menu items that different people in different backgrounds like. We have museums. We have zoos. We have freshly painted bike lanes that aren't that popular in some parts of the city. But we provide many amenities and many basic services because we have a diverse population of people, ages, economics, wants, perspectives of life. This is one, one of them. When I look up at the ceiling, and I know the alderman that's pointed out we can't open that door, when you look at how beautiful this room is, and it's nowhere near as beautiful as the full board of aldermen's chambers. 1904, 
We were the center of the universe. I am from St. Louis, and I am damn proud of the city of St. Louis. I am proud when people see Monday Night Football and show the arch. And hopefully they can play some day games so that they can show the redeveloped North Riverfront going forward. We are the hub of this region. We have to seize control as elected officials and again become the region's leader, leaders. We may not have the greatest number of population, but we have everything else going for us. And going forward for the next decades, we have to keep and be mindful of that. I am very appreciative of the efforts of a lot of people. One is that Governor Nixon. You know, historically people look at us as the stepchild here, the city of St. Louis, that we're bad, things are bad. I have to give the governor credit for going out on the line and pushing and putting the, this project together. I, I, the, the president of the Board of Aldermen, he has worked very hard. Um, he's, he's come around. He has seen the long-term impact that we can have on some issues that are important to him. His issues are not just minority inclusion. His issues are the region and the city of St. Louis, too. But to provide someone a job in the skills for a lifetime that otherwise wouldn't have an opportunity these guarantees that Alderman French and some of the other members, Alderman Moore, worked out. This isn't just a three-year job. This is a lifetime of training. That the many of these individuals here in the city will have the ability to generate a rational, reasonable, well-paying paycheck for generations to come. And they will be in the unions, and they will do well. There are so many reasons to be for this, and you can always find a couple of reasons to be against it. And you can pick this word and pick that word. When you have documents this big, I can find a million reasons to be against it. But I'm proud to be a St. Louisans. And I'm going to be particularly proud when the stadium finally gets built. Mr. Clark, I will renew my motion to pass committee substitute for board bill 219 out of committee with a due pass recommendation. I'll second that. As amended and has been seconded. Please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy. Aye. Alderman Moore. Pass. Alderman French. Aye. Alderman Vicaro. Aye. <clears throat> Alderman Carter. No. Alderwoman Murphy. Aye. Alderman Ogilvy. No. President Reed. Aye. Chairman Conway. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. All I do is lose. Seven ayes, two noes. By your vote, you have passed out committee substitute as amended for board bill 219. Thank you all for being here with a due pass recommendation. Meeting is adjourned.